So our next uh, speaker is Andy Wood. Um, Andy Wood is a scientist here at NPA, and um, he also um, kindly um, co-led one of the tutorials, namely the hydro tutorial. Um, Andy is a hydrologist um, um, by training, and he will be talking about S2S forecasting and hydrology. Uh, we're looking forward to your talk, Andy. Uh, thanks, Judith. Um, yeah, I'll talk about <clears throat> some methods and concepts in trying to do S2S prediction for hydrology and stream flow. Um, the first part of my talk will mainly about, be about seasonal stream flow predictability and this, these concepts of where uh, we see sources of predictability. And then I'll give some examples of ways in which uh, the community is trying to harness climate and watershed predictability to uh, create real world forecasts. Um, so one of the main things to think about when you're trying to do S2S prediction in hydrology is that there are several sources of skill involved. Um, it may be a little bit different from climate forecasts in that regard. In climate forecasts, you think about the land surface, and but a lot of the, the driver of that predictability comes from the oceans. In hydrological predictability or stream flow predictability, you think about, sorry, about the watershed the amount of moisture and energy stored in watersheds um, that needs to evolve over the forecast period. And then, and so that forms one major source of predictability that we call initial hydrologic conditions. And then the second form, major form of predictability is meteorological predictability. Basically, how well can we estimate future climate and weather um, that will drive the response of the basin after starting from those initial conditions? And so in hydrology for many, many years, since we didn't really have great knowledge about future climate conditions when hydrologic prediction really got going to try to drive uh, stakeholder communities like water, like water management, energy management, um, we mainly tried to harness the initial condition, the initial hydrologic predictability, even though there were these two sources. So back in the 70s when uh, climate forecasting was not well developed, you at least had the ability to uh, take a watershed model, spin it up to try to get a good estimate of the current moisture in the catchment. And then the main technique that evolved was called ESP, which is basically driving that initial condition forward using historical sequences of weather from the starting date that you were making the forward, the initialization date. And then the uncertainty of just having to select a sample of past weather sequences would, would emerge as the forecast lead time became longer. And so this is kind of a depiction of, of that framework. Um, it, one of the main weaknesses of this framework is that it assumes that you know these initial conditions perfectly. Um, and one, I should say that one of the main ways that people have tried to incorporate climate forecast information into this kind of uh, approach, this ESP approach, is to take those historical sequences and then to condition them based on information about climate. And as I'll show, that can come from multiple sources. And that's called a trace weighting, ensemble trace weighting approach. There are a lot of papers on that that go back uh, quite a bit. In any case, um, I've been doing this kind of research for a long time. And back in the early 2000s, after making quite a few presentations on using this technique in kind of a research mode, but also to do um, forecasting and hindcasting and skill assessment for different parts of the world, I started to think about what else we could learn from hindcast. So a hindcast is basically a whole series of past forecasts that you initialize and drive forward. And it, typically, the way you look at those hindcasts is the ESP forecasting way, where you just look at the skill of the uh, forecast that's been driven by, you know, uncertain climate with this assumed perfect initial condition, and compare that to observations. But one of the things I decided to do was to reverse the approach and then look at what kind of skill or uncertainty you would get, how that would propagate through the forecast if you instead assumed you had a perfect meteorological forecast. And then you combine that with uncertain initial conditions. And then being able to look at how uncertainty or com conversely forecast signal propagates into the forecast period, you can tell 
throughout the year what the relative importance of these um, two sources of predictability are. And then you can sort of combine them in a, a ratio of uncertainty that um, is gives you a quantitative attribution. So this kind of started to develop a, a more formal framework for attribution and quantification of hydrologic prediction uncertainty. And one thing to be aware of is these uh, contributions vary quite a bit seasonally. You know, if you look at the sort of precipitation inputs in this gray uh, going throughout the season in two different locations, one in Northern California, another one in um, Northern New Mexico, you can see that um, not only do the contributions from precipitation inputs to watershed vary seasonally, but also kind of the balance of moisture stored in the watershed where here SWE is a snowpack, soil moisture is SM, um, and those storages are, are the drivers of that initial watershed uh, predictability. So just to highlight really quickly that this type of analysis can really draw some contrast in how hydrologic predictability works. This is showing, again, for those two watersheds, um, this ratio of errors that you would get from these two formulations, ESP and reverse ESP, and you know, one of the things that immediately shows you as a contrast where if you initialize a forecast in October in California, um, this the climate forecasts are a much more important driver uh, than the initial conditions initially. This flips by the time you get to spring, sort of April, May, initializing forecasts. And here, uh, the initial condition uncertainty is a much more um, important driver of future uncertainty. And then the reverse is true down in northern New Mexico. So it just kind of illustrates the complexity of uh, this interplay between these two sources of predictability. Um, people have since gone further, including myself, in characterizing these contributions uh, both nationally. And this is kind of illustrating a concept of a forecast skill elasticity. So the sensitivity of runoff forecast skill to skill in estimating initial conditions or estimating future climate forecasts. And this shows for about 400 or to 500 basins around the US um, that there are these seasonal variations in how these different sources of predictability impact the runoff prediction. So I don't wanna spend too much time uh, talking about this particular result, but one notable feature you can see from this kind of a analysis is that say in the West Coast, the initial condition uncertainty is, is very important as you get from January and in, into spring and summer, um, not so much the uh, climate forecast uh, predictability. So they're just nice to be aware that this varies quite a bit. There have been subsequent studies of this kind of um, predictability balance in the US and Europe and Canada and global analyses. Um, forecast, operational forecast centers have gone and done analyses so that they can try to understand where best to put um, investment and effort to improve a runoff forecast, whether in better climate forecasts or better uh, initial conditions. Um, and so with this knowledge that these two sources are important, um, there are many, many ways uh, that people are currently working to try to harness uh, this predictability. There um, are purely empirical, statistical, and now more recently machine learning ways where we try to assess uh, sources of skill in climate indices or reanalysis fields. There are dynamical model combinations or uh, sequences or chains of analysis that use, um, instead of empirical methods, more climate modeling or watershed modeling um, to come out with streamflow. There are, of course, hybrids of these approaches would include elements of empirical techniques as well as uh, model-based information in sort of traditional, the traditional ways are still being used where, as I mentioned, you might take a hydrology model, try to make forecasts and then condition it with climate information. Um, I actually spent a number, uh, I at least one study with one postdoc really delving deeply into how different ways of combining the source of predictability would play out if you're doing watershed scale forecasting. So using those initial benchmark methods like the ESP I mentioned, 
which capture mainly initial condition predictability. Um, we made hindcasts of spring runoff forecasts, which are called, called water supply forecasts, and then just start to layer in different ways of also trying to capture meteorological predictability and climate, and then eventually to combine it uh, with uh, the initial condition predictability. So, you know, one example is just for harnessing meteorological or climate predictability is just to do um, kind of empirical regressions, component-based regression on uh, climate states and, and climate variables and relating those to stream flow, but that doesn't necessarily know anything about the initial condition uncertainty. Um, there are various ways of merging uh, the information, one of which is that trace weighting scheme I talked about um, before. And then there's also just, you know, model averaging type techniques like Bayesian model averaging, quantile model averaging, you know, skill weighted ensemble blending, you know, all kinds of um, things that you can think of to do. Um, when we went back and looked at this, you know, this is for predicting watershed flows in uh, northwest of the U.S. in various watersheds. We could um, systematically compare how well these kinds of approaches played out, like the ones that use only the watershed initial conditions versus the ones that use only climate information versus ones that merge both. And in general, as we go through this, we tended to find that um, as somewhat as expected, uh, methods that merge this, this uh, merge the two sources of information like the BMA or QMA or, or skill weighted ensembles, these green boxes and this purple box tended to do well throughout the whole forecast period. When you start in October and you make spring runoff forecasts going all the way up to the spring. Um, the only climate methods tended to do well early in the season, but as again, as we saw in those earlier plots, when you start to pick up watershed moisture in, in the winter and spring, then you really have to also have that as a main source of information. And by the end of the season, if you're only accounting for watershed information, that can be quite skillful. So it, one of the things I wanted to mention is that this week in the tutorial, the students um, took a set of hindcasts that I had made for Buffalo Bill Reservoir, kind of small case study to the north of us in Wyoming, and they applied a trace weighting or climate conditioning scheme on the ensembles. And uh, it was, you know, given the short amount of time that we had, it was fairly ad hoc ex exploration and experimentation with different weighting schemes. But in general, um, we found that you could get marginal improvements in these uh, watershed only ESPs if you condition them on climate information, which came from ECMWF, CS32, and NSFS2S forecasts, as well as climate indices. So um, not in every year did things work that way, but in this particular year that I'm showing they did. Um, if the green line is the observed stream flow, the blue line, which is the weighted ensemble mean, is closer to it than the red unweighted on some of these. So um, this kind of a, let's check in the time, but this kind of a approach is being actively used in real world, larger uh, regional case studies. Um, I'm just showing an example on this one slide of where, you know, given a strong user need for improved forecasts for big uh, reservoir systems, such as the Colorado River with Lakes Powell and Mead, um, there's, a lot of effort going into trying to translate information being produced on, on a kind of large synoptic scale by forecast producers down into, you know, through post processing and other techniques down to the watershed level and then connected to uh, specific water uh, management inflow forecasts and, and management decisions. Just to give a quick example. Uh, this is work with Sarah Baker, who's at the Bureau of Reclamation. We're able to show that you could, you know, reduce the error of inflow forecasts for Lake Powell by conditioning them um, with a sort of analog technique using national multimodal ensemble uh, climate information. Um, just the, this bears out when you look at the errors where the yellow error is, uh, again, a volume forecast starting in August going through the next year for the 
spring runoff. And we can see that by including this climate information, these purple and blue uh, errors tend to end up being lower. So that's very helpful. Um, and finally, I just wanted to say that uh, this work in hydrologic prediction is not just local, regional, national, but also global. There are an expanding number of activities to try to bring together the kinds of forecasting that are done in major centers around the world and then with local experts um, to produce global uh, actionable forecasts. Um, again, by combining this knowledge of predictability, but also taking information from coupled forecasting approaches and uncoupled forecasting approaches um, and trying to meld them all together into a usable large scale product or global scale product. So with that, I'll just um, go to my final thoughts uh, that I think are important when thinking about hydrologic prediction. One, it's really critical to recognize that there are seasonally varying combinations of land surface and climate predictability that must play, that get combined when you need to try to make a hydrologic prediction. And it's really important to understand how they vary and the best ways to combine them. A lot of different strategies for combining these two sources of skill. Um, for now, we don't tend to be able to take uh, land surface hydrologic outputs directly from global climate forecasting models um, because they haven't been uh, validated or calibrated well enough. Um, and so we have a lot of these kind of uncoupled sequences of analysis to create our forecast. And finally, um, there are a lot of different communities working on this problem uh, from the science angle to the engineering angle. And the more that we bring them together, the better we do. And with that, thanks for your attention. And if I have time for questions, I'll be happy to answer. Thank you very much, Andy. <clears throat> yeah, thank you for this nice overview um, of a field that's sort of quite different in its challenges from at least what we have in the atmosphere. Um, are there any questions? So I have a question. Um, uh, I know this wasn't the topic on the talk of the talk, but um, my understanding is that these hydrological models have a lot of parameters that are being tuned and they are tuned differently for different catchment areas. I was wondering if you could comment on uh, the unification of those to have a parameterized consistent hydrological model. Yeah, that's one of the long-standing challenges in hydrology. And you know the reality is <clears throat> that um, for to get the best forecast or, or simulations from a hydrology model locally now, we still need to do that kind of um, tune parameter estimation in local places, which can be somewhat scientifically unsatisfying. There's a huge um, effort to try to think about how we can do better um, regional parameter estimation that is based on, you know, less on the data in one particular watershed, but data across many, many watersheds, large samples. Um, so to be honest, what I've seen is that for the most part that can get you maybe 70% of the way to what your optimal performance would be and so we really still need to think about how, how best we bring together the local techniques with these regional techniques to get something that will give us what you might have more in the weather and climate models. On the flip side, I would just say that um, for the longest time, I think the climate forecast community and weather forecast communities tend to think about this kind of parameter tuning as being kind of engineering minded, maybe a little bit non-scientific, and um, and maybe have ignored some of the needs to estimate parameters in their own climate models and some of the science that's needed to, to improve climate model simulation through parameter estimation, similar to what hydrologists do. Uh, so I do think maybe there's some learning that can be done from both communities. Uh, I think climate science can learn from the hydrologists and engineers about how they've done this kind of thing. And we can learn from the climate scientists about you know, how to use parameterization changes instead of parameter changes to make improved model simulations. Yeah, thank you. So the, the parameters are the known unknowns in hydrology, where the unknown unknowns <laughs> in the atmosphere. Um, Anish, go ahead. Thanks, Judith. Uh, thanks, Andy. A really nice overview of 
both challenges, but also yeah, like the global collaborations and efforts on this important societal topic. I, my question was re regarding data assimilation and observations of, um, especially on the couple data assimilation side, like other efforts where observations from like the hydrological uh, or hydrology side of like river runoff or, or related variables can then be assimilated into impacting atmospheric precipitation, atmospheric variables and other groups that are working on coupling the data and data assimilation between the hydrology and the atmospheric observations? Uh, yeah, I would say, you know, data assimilation for the land surface has always been a really difficult problem. And for the most part, just in, for hydrological prediction, it's not used anywhere near as widely as it could be. Um, it's quite difficult to estimate, you know, deep, a uh, source of predictability like soil moisture, uh, other things like measurements like stream flow or snowpack or just kind of a mix between imperfect satellite information and you know sometimes very sparse in situ you know point measurements. And so there's a, there's a lot of work that can be done in this area. Um, I do think like there's been potential for from satellite products to do global scale uh, assimilation, and they do get used in, in weather and climate models. How much the land surface state influences the scale of atmospheric predictions is also a very active area of research. And, um, you know, I think as we learn more about which states, when, where, uh, impacts fluxes in the atmosphere or circulation in the atmosphere, we'll be able to target our data assimilation efforts um, more carefully. So. It's step, these are all great, great questions and great areas of research um, to pursue. Thanks. So just sort of to understand better, it, it seems that um, if we would want to go to a next generation hydrological modeling approach that actually uses the atmospheric information, we would need to have better calibrated input for hydrological relevant variables. Would you see this as the biggest hurdle as opposed to um, missing observations for the initialization? And what, what would be the next step to bring those two fields closer together and, and propagate the uncertainty through the whole system? Yeah, I think there, I mean, I think that the land data assimilation, and, and I should mention groups like the GM, GMAO at NASA, are very active in, in pursuing this, particularly using satellite information. Um, but I do think that the combination of the land surface data assimilation to try to bring models closer to uh, good initial states for forecasting that plus improved parameter estimation and process representation and coupled models, um, and then maybe bringing more hydrologists and people who think about the land surface in a different way into global coupled modeling uh, groups and, and development efforts is going to be really critical. You know, I sit in a group in, in um, CGD now uh, that has a lot of um, people thinking about hydrology, but uh, I've noticed and learned that, you know, while being there, that a lot of the thinking is on fluxes that I often don't think too much about. Um, it's more about uh, evaporative flux into the atmosphere than about runoff and, and base flow from the land model. So I, it's just there, there are these different perspectives. And once we get um, really serious about in, improving these land, this land surface hydrology and its ability to capture variability at different scales, you know, sub-watershed, watershed scale, regional scale, um, we will still we will struggle to really fully leverage the kind of predictability we can get from the land surface. I do think there's part of the community that, and I would say most are coming around to this idea that in the future, if we can take a couple Earth system model and get good quality hydrology from it, that would be a preferable solution to having all these sort of uncoupled chains of analysis. And but I think that that goal or that holy grail is still out ahead of us. And I don't think it's unachievable, but I think it takes careful thinking about how we get there. Thank you very much. 
So uh, there are no other questions. Um, I would like to um, thank Andy and uh, introduce our next speaker. Our next speaker.